Is that all? Welcome, everybody. I'd like to welcome participants to this meeting of full council. The meeting is being live streamed to the council's YouTube channel. Welcome to any members of the public who are watching the meeting remotely. The recording of the meeting will remain online for six months. If you are present and making a representation to the meeting, you are consenting to the use of the recordings for broadcasting and training purposes. Please note a fire test, a fire alarm test is not expected, so if the alarm does sound, please make your way to the nearest fire exit. May I also remind members of the new speaking limit, which is now three minutes in debate. So we'll move on to um, apologies. I've got apologies from councillors Bassett Smith, Boys, Klukas and Hay. Councillor Jeffries. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I think Councillor Harvey can be slightly late. Anybody else? No? OK. Declarations of interest. Are there any members um, present that wish to declare any interests? Councillor Babbage. Uh, sorry, just on the second motion, um, I sit on the pension committee and the county council, so I'll, uh, I'll leave the chamber for that one. Thank you. Any other member? No. Minutes of the last meeting, so please use the electronic voting system to approve the minutes, if everybody's agreed they're correct. Councillor Andrews and Councillor Baker, you haven't cast your votes yet. That has been carried. Thank you. Agenda item four is communications by myself. So firstly, some sad news. Peter Barlow, who many of you may know as a stalwart at Remembrance Day services, etc., and who was the former chairman of the Royal British Legion, sadly passed away at the beginning of the month. He was a well-known figure to many people in Cheltenham, especially for organising the many poppy appeals and parades. Also, I have been asked to report that Councillor Phil, County Councillor Phil Orford, who represented the Hynham Division, which borders Springbank, Swindon and St Paul's County Divisions, has also passed away. I'm sure colleagues may well have worked with him on cross-boundary issues. We send our condolences to both families. On a lighter note, I was delighted to welcome four young people into the parlour recently. These four lads, who were aged between 10 and 13, assisted a Springbank youth worker who was being assaulted by a member of the public. It was great to meet them and to congratulate them on their good deed. They're a credit to their families. I would also wish to put on record our thanks to those who supported Cheltenham Borough Council during race week. I'll start with those involved in the Love Your Turf campaign, which I've been told has made a huge difference. However, in particular, I would like to thank Louis Crog and his brilliant team, the licensing officers in, from Tewkesbury, South Gloucestershire and Wolverhampton, as well as Avon and Somerset's police taxi licensing officer. We also had a member of Gloucestershire Constabulary Road's policing team working with licensing to perform stops and vehicle checks on out-of-town private hire vehicles, all of which is resulted in a significant positive difference. Finally, as a reminder, it's not too late to get your names down for the quiz night on Friday the 31st of March. Thank you. We move on now to communications by the Deputy Leader of the Council. Thank you, Madam Mayor. 
I'd also like to put on record my thanks to all of our council staff across the organisation and its partners. I say they do a wonderful job and they do a sizable amount of work behind the scenes that not all, uh, all colleagues can, be, uh, can see, I suspect. Um, I'd also like to thank the vast more, uh, amount of attendees. I think it was a very reasonable race week. There are definitely some things that we'll have to reflect on and have gone on through the time, but I think all the preemptive work this council did with partners has had an impact. Um, but clearly, um, most people had fun. Um, so, yes, echo those thoughts, Madam Mayor. Um, also, as a short update, I'd like to confirm the following last council meeting I've written to Councillor Grevels at the request of Councillor Payne regarding the provision of NHS dentistry service. Um, I've had a response, but uh, just to say that he's got the letter. So, in due course, I'll make sure I get that. Any feedback back to you, Councillor Payne? We have also, and I've mentioned this previously at uh, Leaders Update, but we've also received some feedback on our Leveling Up Fund bid. Um, the fund bid that we submitted. I mean, overall, the feedback we received was a strong, we had a strong bid, but we were not shortlisted for the funding due to needing to strengthen the impact the funding would have had from a cultural perspective, and also it needs to contain more information on the positive impact on our community. Now, we all know how Golden Valley will have that positive impact on our town and our cultural impact it will have on our town, also have it a positive impact on our communities, but clearly we didn't translate that enough in our bid. Now, in my view, funding should be awarded on the strength of need and the project and how, the, how strong the project is, not having to continuously bid for funds. But that's the feedback we've got, and we'll obviously be working on that for the next round of bidding. We're also delighted to have been awarded the bronze at the IESE Public Sector Transformation Awards. This celebrates the most innovative practice in transforming public services. The Climate Impact Assessment Tool was one of 30 nominations in the innovation category. And that's really good positive recognition for the hard work undertaken by our climate change team. So well done to all of those. And of course, the Cabinet and Lead. Finally, I'd like to share that on the 7th and 8th of March, we hosted the LG Challenge, Local Government Challenge. This is Local Government's version of The Apprentice. And we have the pleasure of hosting 10 of the best and brightest from the LG community to Cheltenham. The challenge was set for them to look at how we can ensure that Golden Valley Development delivers inclusive growth and opportunity to those communities and families who face the biggest challenges in our time. Bit of a tough question. They worked really, really hard. And that work was completed in less than 24 hours. It was truly astonishing. And we look forward to using and developing their ideas as our Golden Valley Development project moves forward. Thank you, Madam. <laughs> We have none. Agenda item seven is public questions. We have four public questions. Um, so the first question is from um, Mike Farmer to the Cabinet Member for Finance and Assets, Councillor Peter Jeffries. Um, Mike, do you um, take the answer to your question as read? I do. Have you a supplementary? Um, can you hear me? All oh, right, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Councillor Jeffries for his uh, very full answer. Um, and I'd particularly wish to uh, ask a supplementary about the first paragraph of the answer, and in particular the second paragraph, um, where it says that financially the outcome won't be known until after the, the, the next election. Um, uh, that's the kind of answer my accountant would give me. Um, but I'd, I'd like if uh, Councillor Jeffries could expand a bit further on that. Has the council made any assessment of the costs of introducing voter ID and the adequacy of government funding for it? Thank you, Mr Farmer. I'm not surprised you find it's an accountant's response to your question, being as I'm the Cabinet Member for Finance, and I welcome that observation. <laughs> um, clearly, specific assessments is kind of difficult. I mean, some of the legislation and uh, the guidance from government didn't actually finalise until January. So that's been an ongoing trying to make an assessment. Um, equally, I think the mechanisms by which uh, funding for elections is moved forward and progressed, but like the answer, is quite elongated. So the government made the assessment based on their knowledge, and that's where the, the lump of funding has come from. But clearly, until we get post an election, we won't actually know the specific cost, depending on our needs in Cheltenham. So I'm ter terribly sorry it's the accountant's answer to the question, but it is the answer, unfortunately. Um, I suspect we may have this conversation after the next set of elections to try and work out those costs. Thank you, Mr. Farmer. 
Thank you. I don't believe that we have um, Rich Newman or Peter Frings here to ask their questions. So just to inform uh, members that the written responses will be sent to them. We now move on to agenda item eight, which is members' questions, of which we have six. So first question is from Councillor Harmon to the Cabinet Member for Economic Development, Culture, Tourism and Wellbeing, Councillor Max Wilkinson. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I thank the Cabinet Member for his um, answer and take it as read. Um, I do understand, obviously, that the pod is not staffed full time. I do understand the pod is not staffed full time, but I was surprised there was nobody there last week during the National Hunt Festival when it's such a busy week. Um, and I thank him for his, his answer. Would he agree to do a report um, on progress to the overview and scrutiny committee in, let's say, six or nine months' time on how the strategy is going? Because I think it is important that we do keep watching this, and I'm sure we share the ambition of doing more for tourism than we're currently doing. The short answer is probably yes, but I'm willing to expand upon it. Um, as Councillor Harmon and Councillor Nelson know, because they've been following this issue, and I think this is useful for us to discuss and debate, because, you know, if we were seeking a route, we probably wouldn't start from here, right, with uh, an underfunded local government in a position where, over the pandemic, and we'd lost our, our existing tourist information depository, which was not a tourist information centre, and we'd opened up a new one as a trial, and we've now got the reception area, which Councillor Nelson asked me about before. Um, so we probably wouldn't start from here, but the emerging strategy is something that can be quite positive and innovative. Um, the old model of having uh, a sort of nine to five plus shop, office, reception, whatever, operating every day in the same place um, clearly wasn't something that was particularly effective or financially sustainable for local government. However, in line with many other local areas, we're, we're pursuing something slightly different, and that was contained in the first answer. Um, if it doesn't work, we'll look at alternatives. But I think having people stationed at the pod on weekends uh, will give the pod a purpose, and it will mean um, that people will have somewhere to go uh, to chat to people who have local knowledge uh, on Saturdays and Sundays um, if they don't have a mobile phone or access to the internet. And the default to digital thing, it's sort of fine in most cases, but there are, as we know, a number of people um, from different demographic groups not all older people. There are some people in different demographic groups who don't access digital services. Um, and we mustn't patronise one group or the other. Um, but I'm aware that most of the inquiries I get from this, uh, on this subject, are from, from older people. Um, and that group might not default to digital when visiting a town centre. So it's important we do still have physical repositories, sorry, depositories, whatever the right word is, for tourism information. Uh, and uh, and we, were, we will continue to do so. Uh, and the progress that we've made in the reception, I think, is really positive. The progress we're making at the pod is really positive. And I think it's important that opposition members scrutinise the work on this. Um, and I'm sure in due course, um, we will work with Marketing Cheltenham to bring a paper to ONS when we can work out whether the current trial scheme has been something that, uh, that it work, works for Cheltenham. Thank you. Question number two is from Councillor Wendy Flynn to the Cabinet Member for Climate Emergency, Councillor Alicia Lewis. Councillor Flynn, do you take the answer as read and do you have a supplementary? Um, I do take the answer as read and I don't have a supplementary, thank you. Thank you. Question three is from Councillor Wendy Flynn to Cabinet Member for Economic Development, Culture, Tourism and Wellbeing. Councillor Max Wilkinson. So, Councillor Flynn, do you take your responses read and do you have a supplementary? Um, I take it as read, yes, thank you. I do um, have a quick supplementary, I, th supplementary, I think, um, which is, is uh, I mean, it doesn't look like uh, there'll be any fixed power supply in place um, for this year. Um, Basically, is that the case, and will a, a ice rink go ahead um, without that? Thank you. Well, it doesn't look like there's going to be, as you've rightly pointed out there. Um, the intention is to still go ahead with an ice rink, but you'll recall from, sorry, by the, by the Mayor, Councillor Flynn will recall from 
last year's discussions about the ice rink, which didn't end up coming to Cheltenham, uh, was that we were going to pursue alternative strategies and we weren't going to have, sorry, alternative strategies for energy and we weren't going to have a traditional diesel generator. Um, and I'm confident that if we don't have electrical infrastructure in the gardens for this winter, then certainly we won't be going for a, a traditional diesel generator. And some of the technologies that are available, the Council of Flynn might want to, um, to research, um, they can produce substantial carbon savings, um, which I think shows a positive trajectory. And of course, we've adopted our climate decision-making wheel, which is really important, um, and that will guide us on these kinds of decisions. Um, but what that doesn't do is say, stop the world, nothing's ever going to happen. Uh, and if we're going to bring the public along with us on matters to do with climate change, I think the worst way to do so would be to say, you can't enjoy things. Thank you. Question four is from Councillor Wensley Flynn to the Cabinet Member for Economic Development, Culture, Tourism and Wellbeing. Councillor Max Wilkinson, uh, do you take the answer as read, Councillor Flynn, and do you have a supplementary? I do, and, and I do have a supplementary, uh, mainly because the answer, the very long answer, doesn't answer the question. Um, and I, I just really, um, the, looking at, at that, the conclusion I'd, I've drawn is that actually the paint didn't have any effect over um, that which a normal wall would bounce back urine. Uh, and I, I just really, I wondered if the Cabinet member could assure me that the, uh, that the anti we paint campaign uh, was not, not just a gimmick to gain political capital, and it was a, meant to be a solid action to address a, a serious problem, something that, you know, that our residents are very concerned about. Thank you. Thank you to Councillor Flynn for the follow-up. Uh, I haven't tested the paint myself, so I can't tell you if the effect was any better than a normal wool. However, the suggestion from the makers is that it does. However, as we've said in the answer, we can review all this, we can look at whether the campaign, the war and we, has worked this year and look to adjust in future. I do note that over race week, there were still um, plenty of reports of people urinating in public. There were some in Councillor Fifield's uh, county division and Councillor Payne's uh, borough division up in Prestbury. I got reports from there and there were numerous other reports. Um, and Councillor Finn seems to be suggesting that I'm making light of this subject um, in all of the media coverage. I don't think I've been seen smiling about people urinating in public because I think it is a problem and I think it is something we need to address um, for matters of public health, of safety and equality. Um, so I'm taking this very seriously. We'll do a proper review. Uh, and uh, I'm th I think that this council can be pleased um, with the work that we've done this year to let people who are visiting Cheltenham know that weeing in the street in broad daylight isn't acceptable during festival week, just as it is not for the other 51 weeks of the year. Thank you. Question five is from Councillor Tabby Joy to the Cabinet Member for Cyber, Regeneration and Commercial Income, Councillor Mike Collins. Councillor Joy, do you take the answer as read and do you have a supplementary? Thanks so much. Um, I do take the answer as read, um, but I do have a supplementary if that's okay to ask it. Um, so my question was um, specifically about town, town centre cycle paths, because um, the thing is that while I do agree that you know legally e-scooters are supposed to be used on the roads, that's obviously not happening. It you know like we 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 often see people using them on pavements, and it makes sense to have that third option just in place. The thing is that there are a number of places like Lansdowne Road, the cycle paths are really, really bumpy. There are often cut bars, vans or cars parked on dedicated cycle routes, so it somewhat misses the point to be looking at the Gloucestershire -wide County county-wide spine or the Bishop's Cleave to Cheltenham route because in the middle of the town centre, people aren't confident driving. It's still quite dangerous. I just wanted to know if there was going to be um, a way of prioritising the you know, like the needs of the otherwise poorly maintained and unreliable town, town centre specific sites. Thanks. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, uh, thank you, Councillor Joy, for your, your question there. Um, I would like to start off saying how sorry I am, and I'm sure everyone else is sorry too, at the tragic death of Mrs Linda Davis, who died as a result of this incident that was referred to in the question in Rainworth in Nottinghamshire last year. I think it is important to give some 
relevant background here, uh, I think it's worth pointing out that the individual who caused Mrs. Davis's death was a 14-year-old boy who was riding a privately owned scooter illegally on the pavement without insurance and obviously without a driver's licence. I'm sure that we've all seen, as Councillor George referred to, young people riding e-scooters illegally in Cheltenham on pavements without driver licences or insurance, two up, not giving any regard to the law of the road at all. So in this sad case, it was not the lack of a safe cycle path, but the actions of someone who chose to break the law that caused Mrs Davis's mm -hmm. death. Once again, I'm not sure the Green Party have been doing their homework here. We have been and we will continue to work with Gloucestershire County Council to ensure that safe and reliable networks of walking and cycling paths are installed in and around Cheltenham, as well as numerous other alternative transport methods. Once again, I think that you should be reading in detail the Connecting Cheltenham report as it goes some way to answering the original question that you asked. And finally, I think it's also remi worth reminding you that it is Gloucestershire County Council who are the local highways authority and not Cheltenham Borough Council. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> the final question, question six, is from Councillor Tabby Joy to the Cabinet Member for Cyber Regeneration and Commercial Income, Councillor Mike Collins. Councillor, um, Councillor Joy, do you take the answer as read and do you have a supplementary? No, um, I'm really happy to take the answer as read and um, I find it quite informative. Thank you. I don't have a supplementary. Thank you. So we move on to agenda item nine, the capital non-treasury investment, treasury management and MRP strategies and statements. So I invite the cabinet member for finance and assets, Councillor P Peter Jeffries, to introduce the report on behalf of the leader. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, members who've sat on this council for many years will recall the journey we've had with 10 years of austerity and our commitment to fund discretionary services. Even newer members will understand uh, where our funding is. We just had our budgetary meeting at the very last council meeting. And this council took a route to commercialise operations wherever possible, with the cost of services of over £22 million and in the income from local taxation and grants leasing to over £14 million. Pounds. We have a void to fill. Trading and investment income does that. Now, how we use our capital and what we do with our money and how we manage investments is more important than ever to make sure we're maximising the returns we are able to generate to support our general fund budget. The documents presented today are set, set out how we plan to do that over the next 12 months. Now, these strategies are all mandatory for local authorities and should be reviewed and approved by Council each year. Together with our asset management strategy, they provide the framework for all our capital, asset and investment decisions for the coming year. Also presented today for approval is the annual minimum revenue position statement. Colleagues, this explains how the repayment of our borrowings has been calculated. There have been no significant changes to our approach for the coming year, as we are still waiting for a formal response to the government consultation from 2021, which has still not been published. I'm not going to labour this much more, Madam Mayor, so I recommend these documents to the Council for approval. I don't take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Any member, any questions? No, no questions at all? Okay, um, so we move on to the debate. So if any member wishes to speak to this item, it's a three minutes maximum. Councillor Willingham. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just wanted to uh, thank the officers who have um, got this template um, and made these documents far more accessible. I think these are really, really well produced documents um, and uh, a lot better than black and white reports that I think we've had before. So it's just really to thank the officers for their, their work on doing this and I hope that more of the documents we produce as a council in terms of policies and um, what have you will have a similar format because it is much more accessible. So, thank you. Any other member? 
Councillor Atherston. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. I'd just like to echo uh, Councillor Willingham's comments there. I too found the documents uh, very easy to read and with great uh, descriptions where perhaps um, before I became a councillor, I might not know what, the, the, what that term actually meant. So it's a huge thanks to the officers for that and the cabinet lead. And also to say how well the capital strategy and the investment strategy um, lend themselves to our, 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 uh, our new corporate plan. And I'm very grateful for that, where there's fantastic support for us achieving our goals in terms of building more affordable net zero homes. So thank you. Thank you. Councillor Babby. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to ask, well, a bit of a question um, as well, if that's okay, but um, around the current sort of borrowing strategy, funding um, investments and, and per, like property purchases, things like that, um, has tended more recently to focus on using short-term loans to, f to fund longer-term um, purchases. Um, that was obviously based on the, the idea that interest rates would stay low. They have been creeping up. I guess my question is, what is the impact of that increase in interest rates when we do come to have to renew some of these loans, when we have to roll some of these loans forward? Um, and what, yeah, what is the impact on you know, purchase either investments that we already have um, in terms of borrowing, but also potentially um, new spending in future. Madam Mayor, that's quite a technical answer, so I'll ask Paul to follow, if I may. Thank you. better yeah uh, so uh, just in terms of um, our, our sort of strategy it's it's very much a hybrid um, all of those investments which I would classify uh, as operational are very much subject to long-term borrowing so if we think back to four or five years ago when we made a number of uh, strategic investments across the town including a supermarket a couple of office buildings uh, those were financed using what's called a basket of maturities. Uh, so instead of taking one loan over 40 years, we took 40 loans over 40 years, uh, whereby the first loan would have matured in first year, sec second in year two, third year three, and so on right up to uh, year 40. So all of those uh, loans are fixed. The rationale for doing that was it saved somewhere in the region of uh, £990,000 in interest uh, over the course of the 40 years. The only strategic investment that we've now uh, got in terms of short-term borrowing is our land acquisition at West Cheltenham. And the rationale for that is because if we get this right, obviously over time we'll be releasing plots uh, to uh, the developer to, to develop out, and therefore this council will be receiving capital receipts uh, to effectively offset the, that debt repayment. So I just want to give uh, you and all members uh, assurance that we, ha we, ha we are not in the situation where the majority of our debt is on short term, very much uh, fix fixed term where, where I consider it prudent. Thank you. Any other member? Councillor Chellin. Thank you. Um, I, I was just struck on page 36 um, when, when talking about the capital um, funding. Um, section 5.5, throughout the financial year, available sources of funding will continue to be reviewed as new schemes are announced by the government to support local government. And it just struck me, you know, what opportunity costs there are there, you know, how much time and effort to, to actually be seeking those um, th those sources of funding from the government uh, as, a, as a separate, you know, chasing it around uh, along with other uh, local authorities. Councillor Collins. Thank you, Mayor. I think it's worth um, just pointing out that we've had some questions about the costs and the finances of, of our priorities, but 
If I refer everybody to page 32, our key priority one, enhance Cheltenham's reputation as a cyber capital of the UK. Well, um, I'm really pleased to be able to, to say that, well, that started because we are actually hosting a delegation from Canada um, in the next, today and in the next couple of days, Canada meets Gloucestershire Cyber. And uh, so Canada's heard about it and they're interested in getting involved. So maybe that will be a source of income that will offset some of our costs in the first place. And long may it continue, I hope it's the first of many. Thank you. Any other member? No? Okay, so before we go to the vote, can I invite the Cabinet member? Oh, Councillor Flynn. Okay. I mean, I, I just wanted to make a, a quick comment, really. There's, I mean, there's a lot, a lot in here. Um, I, I welcome the, um, the investment in homes, and I, I think most people would. Um, I'm concerned about the, the sort of reliance on Golden Valley, which represents a huge investment, um, and... and is set to deliver so many outcomes, um, but I just I just don't think we should forget to invest in in things like the Leisure Act um, as well, and and make sure that you know that that things are balanced across the across the range of things. Because um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any other member? No. Okay. So, Councillor Jeffrey. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, yes, I've got to ask Paul to uh, answer the technical terms on that one because I would have got that slightly differently in different language. Same result that you've had to, from the horse's mouth there. I think it's interesting, though, that, that hybrid model and how Cheltenham does things differently. It's what we do in Cheltenham. We find solutions to, to issues. Councillor Cheltenham, you're quite correct. Bidding for council or central government funding is costly, timely, it takes resources, takes lots of time, folk, takes folks away from other things. Unfortunately, that's the nature in which the government does things now. We've had all that austerity where they took a lot of the funding away and then they released a pot of funding and we have to bid for that. I think it's, um, I think the uh, levelling up fund, I think the last media round on that sort of highlighted the, the pitfalls when it comes to bidding for funding. I think that was a, the media did try to focus on that. So yes, I agree, it's not the most efficient way. Uh, Councillor Flynn, I think um, your, your reference to there's a huge reliance. I think that's a, maybe a bit of a false perception, but I take your point. Uh, I think the economy's taken a bit of a kick over the last couple of years. I had that economy not taken a kick, we may have been in a different position to have more investments coming down the track and more investments into our infrastructure and so forth. So I take the point though. I did hear, hear what you said. I think the, the most interesting point raised by a colleague in this chamber, um, Councillor Willingham, I'm grateful for your, your highlighting the fact that the accessibility of these documents because that was actually something which we, we was raised at a previous council meeting when I think one of the very first documents designed in this sort of manner came forward and how colleagues made, a couple of colleagues around the chamber made some comments around that. And I'm really pleased that accessibility and readability of documents like this is key because whilst we immerse ourselves here in policies and documents and we, we get used to sort of how they're, form, they're formulated, actually for the people in our town, for our residents to be able to read them is, is I think, much better. So you're highlighting that. I think I'm very grateful. I'll pass on that, your, your comments to officers. I don't think any officer in the room at the time, but I know other officers would have heard those comments. Um, I commend the report to you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll move to the vote on the recommendations, and I invite members to use the electronic voting system. That was unanimous, thank you. So we'll move on to agenda item 10, which is the carbon footprint report 2021 to 2022. And I invite the cabinet member for climate emergency, Councillor Alicia Lewis, to introduce the report. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I want to bring up a bit of a story about a very dear friend and former mentor of mine who told me many years ago in a very sort of offhand joking manner that believing in the idea that you can make real progress in local government is a bit like Father Christmas. You believe in it when you're young, but you soon grow out of it. I'm getting on a bit now, but I think this report, 
I am getting on a bit now. But I think this report, colleagues and friends, does keep that dream alive. I think this is a really exciting opportunity for us all. There's a lot of numbers in this report, and I apologise for how many numbers you are going to have to have read to have understood this report. But there's two that really matter. So if you are skim reading it now, I will point out the ones you want to get to. Under unbelievable pressure, and we really can't underestimate just how many multifaceted layers of pressure that this council is under right now, we have made real progress in reducing our council's carbon footprint. So much so that we've actually exceeded the amount that we would need to reduce our carbon footprint by in order for this council to reach its net zero 2030 target for the administration and activities of Cheltenham Borough Council. Very good. I think for us as a Lib Dem Council standing on the front line of the battle for a Liberal Britain, this is us doing something quite exciting. We've had lots of other councils who are otherwise Lib Dem run saying, how are you doing this? How can we do more? So it's fantastic that Cheltenham Borough Council is leading the way. I'm really delighted to be able to announce to you all that our bid for funding to del deliver a heat pump at Leisure At has in fact been successful. I'm really excited. It does extend this incredible lifeline to help protect Leisure Out and the fantastic swimming pool that I know many of us use and many of our constituents enjoy. And it's such a difficult time for so many leisure centres across this country because fuel bills are through the roof and it's difficult for many to pay extra to use these services. This, alongside our really ambitious plans to develop solar across our portfolio and working with Cheltenham Borough Homes to deliver net zero homes, and even our investment in testing the viability of some heat networks in Cheltenham really does feel like a plan to get this town and this council to net zero. Finding the right solutions in the climate crisis in the face of a lot of changing tech and some very high heritage standards, and we're not willing to compromise on those heritage standards, is a tough challenge. But this is Cheltenham Borough Council, and we've never been afraid of those. We're investing in Cheltenham's future today and investing in solutions that will, I can only hope, outlive me and the rest of us if we are very lucky. So, Council, I commend this report and the dedicated service of our officers who have made it possible to you and welcome questions. Thank you. Any member have a question? We have some questions pre-submitted by Councillor Joy. Is she going to answer those now? Okay. Before I go to Councillor Payne, I've been advised that Councillor Joy pre-submitted some questions. Would you like to ask, ask those now? Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, I sent these sort of as a matter of course for members' questions, but we found that they actually fitted quite well into the carbon footprint report. Um, I think in some ways I'm quite happy to just proceed to the questions and debate stage, really, because, um, you know, I've, I've been through the report and um, sort of read it in some detail and compared them against some of the original questions that I'd submitted. So, um, you know, I'm happy to just enter into the debate along with everyone else. I think that's fine. Thank you, Councillor Joy. Councillor Payne. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, thank you for the report. I, I think it's really important that we've produced it. I think we need to have our work uh, into the public domain a lot more. I have two questions, if I may. Um, it's in any study where you are comparing one year with the next, and that's a practical way of doing it, you need a baseline. I am looking for some reassurance that the baseline that we've selected is sound because a lot of the data from previous years has been based on national statistics and estimates. And as the report says, as we develop our understanding, we change our views on things. So that's my first question. My second one relates to the um, risk assessment. And there are three risks identified. Um, the first one is around finance. Um, <coughs> the likelihood being four, which is quite high. I'm surprised that the impact 
is only three. Because without good financing, this project is going nowhere. And we've seen from Cheltenham Borough Homes the amount of money that's needed to address carbon neutrality is huge. Uh, the second one, the, the other two um, risks are, um, are, are scored. I've never seen a risk report with such high scoring. So I, I'm looking for some reassurance from the Cabinet member that actions are in place to address these concerns, concerns that really threaten the whole project. So I'm, I'm looking for reassurance if, you could, if she could provide that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Paid. I appreciate your questions. You always come to these reports having read them in great detail and spotted the interesting bits, as is always the case with you, John. So first and um, foremost, the new baseline, is it sound? There's a reason we've done some adjustments to our methodology since the last report, and they are predominantly because we wanted a more accurate report. We were working with an industry expert who said, actually, there's a lot of national averaging going on, as you'll have seen from the last report, and we could do a bit better than that. And this report really does that. We have gone out of our way to do more extensive research, to go in far more depth than we had previously, which means we've had to adjust both this year's and the baseline to reflect that methodology change. So I commend the new methodology. I think it's the right approach. There are a few things that I mentioned right at the end of the report that I want more detail on, things like a breakdown across properties that will happen next time. There is a constant process of iteration and improvement going on here, John. So it is definitely... A good thing and I think it can only get better from here and on in terms of the risk assessment I think the nature of the issue the risk is understandably very high if we can't resolve the climate crisis and we can't invest in these solutions we're going to have a lot of problems and I can however reassure the cabinet member not the cabinet member the, the member I have to reassure myself sometimes that we have in fact got both you know, a mechanism for the finance which is the green new deal and we are working extensively on the areas where we need to shore up some things in order to make sure that everything we are committing to will happen. So I can reassure you that this investment is incredibly important for Cheltenham's future and we take it as seriously as you'd expect. Thank you. Any other member have a question? Councillor Baker. <coughs> Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. I love, I love the fact that our Cabinet Member for the Climate Emergency is just so knowledgeable, engaged, positive, and enthusiastic about her subject. She clearly loves her portfolio. That comes across every time you hear her speak, and the depth of her knowledge on it is, 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 is amazing. So thank you very much for that, Alicia. Just a couple of questions from me. Great news, great news about the air source heat pump at Leisure Rat. And that is going to make a life-changing um, impact upon the running of that facility. And as you, as you mentioned, keeping it open. Can I ask that you are able to share that information with the Lido? Because obviously they are having similar issues at the moment. So anything that we can learn and share would be brilliant. Um, and can I just ask whether there's any update on the boiler situation here in the Muni, where we were looking at a different source of heat from the gas to replace the gas boiler. But there's been any, any I think that's the case. There's any update on that? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Baker, for some incredibly generous comments. I'm going to cry, but we're going to stick with it. So, first point on the Lido. Yes, we are more than happy to share everything we've learned, including you know the stuff we've been working on for the bid to Salix well, and what it is we think is doable. We just have to get some. I's dotted and T's crossed in order to make sure that this all goes through the way we hope it will. So once I've got everything in place, I will make sure they have it and we can have a discussion about what's working for us because ultimately the Lido are very good friends of ours and partners of ours in this town. And if we can share what we're learning and what we're trialling with them and they end up with a better solution as a result, win-win as far as I'm concerned. And then the second question was, you might have to remind me, Paul, I apologise. <laughs> Oh, yes. Apologies. The in-house boiler, the answer to that question is yes, we have transitioned away from a gas boiler. It's now electric. There is a slight adjustment in some of our carbon footprint you'll see in the report because we're using more electric and less gas. So we've got a 
balance that out. But yes, and that's generally the approach that we're taking, where we have things at Cheltenham Borough Council that we need to replace or to change. The answer is always, how can we make it more sustainable? It's not necessarily the best route for all of us to rip things out which are still working because that's not good for the climate. But where we are replacing things, we are always looking for the most sustainable options. So yes, that has happened. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Any other member have a question? No? Okay. I think, oh, Councillor Flynn. Sorry, I, I mean, I just wondered, uh, with CBH being removed uh, from the report, um, I wondered what, uh, what the council was going to do uh, to ensure there's equal scrutiny of the carbon emissions associated with, with Cheltenham Borough Homes and action towards net zero for 2030 at CBH. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. So just so everybody understands the methodology and why we've made this decision, we think that Cheltenham Borough Home should be publishing its own carbon footprint in order for us to be able to make informed decisions about what's going on there, what's going on here. We need that kind of detail. And we think the residents in Cheltenham Borough Homes properties ought to know. It's the kind of thing they're asking for. And we will be sharing all of our methodology, all our templates, reports from this report with them to make it easier for them to do it. And I'm sure that they will be, once they have published theirs, happy to discuss it in ORS or some kind of, you know, scrutiny opportunity because I think that's possibly the best way to do it. But when they do publish theirs, probably prior to it, it will come to us at the climate team and we will have a review of what's happening and we will have a continuous conversation with them about where we can make improvements and where the things Cheltenham Borough Council are doing can be shared, things can be learned. Where we're having successes, we want to turn to them and say, we've done this thing, it's working really well for us. Any chance you want to drop on board? Any, if they have any problems, they can come talk to us and say, how is it you're doing X? We are in constant conversation. And once they publish their reports, we can have a lengthier discussion about how we're going to make sure they get the scrutiny they need and the residents get the transparency they deserve. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just wanted to ask, when it comes to the airport, um, how are emissions connected with flights um, accounted for here? Do they, I assume they're not under scope one and two. Are they under scope three, though, presumably? Or, um, if I could just ask that, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Badridge. Those are not our emissions. They are their emissions, so we do need them to declare. We've openly encouraged them to publish their carbon footprint. We've discussed you know, the opportunities for that, and they're looking at some projects for how that's going to be possible. But the actual flights are not something we will be declaring as part of Cheltenham Borough Council's footprint. We are only declaring that which we finance, which is the ground, sort, the ground fuel and things. They, one can only hope, will come to scrutiny and we can have that discussion about their carbon footprint rather than ours, because it's not our scope three. Any other member? Councillor. Thank you. Um, just to follow up on the CBH reporting, I was just curious to know if um, there are plans to incorporate CBH reports um, in the carbon footprint going from this year onwards, because um, while that makes sense that it's excluded from the reports here and um, there's an explanation in the appendices as well why it wasn't included. But um, the thing is that around 26% of UK emissions are actually based in domestic properties, so it is still quite an important thing to element. I was just wondering if it would be included in these carbon footprint reports um, after this year's. Thank you, Councillor Joy. I'm happy to discuss with them the possibility of us publishing at a very similar time or publishing sort of as an additional sort of footnote or as an additional document, but it's not going to be included within Cheltenham Borough Council's footprint because it's their emissions, their operation costs rather than ours. So that's happy to publish it and make sure it gets to this council, but that's the division on that. I mean, I have a follow-up to that because um, specifically it says methodology for gathering data was specific to CBC and its partner organisations. So um, how is CBH not included in that? CBH are, of course, included in our partner organisations and we're sharing everything we're learning, all of our reports and all the expertise we've developed in producing this report with them so that when they do declare, we end up with something very consistent and we're all discussing very similar things on the same wavelength. Sorry, I do have just, just one more question. On the, uh, on the summary, right at the very end, um, it talks about um, reductions uh, and the, the, the annual average that they need to be. 
and the assessed total decrease in emissions from last year. And then it gives a figure which is most of the assessed total decrease in emissions from last year that's due, due to procurement and variances, alterations. I mean, I, 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 I don't really understand that very much. Um, and it looks like we haven't made very much progress at all towards, towards uh, net zero last year. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. I think it's incredibly clear from this report that we have made substantial progress, and I thank colleagues in supporting me in doing that. I'm happy to get you a full breakdown on exactly what's included within that, but I think we should be incredibly proud of the progress we're making and excited about the progress we're going to be making in future. Thank you. Any other member? No? Okay. So we'll move on to the debate. And any member who wishes to speak? Did you have a, a question? Your the debate, okay. And just to remind members that it's um, three three minutes to speak. Right. So I've got <laughs> councillor <laughs> councillor Doby or councillor Hallwood. Fight it out amongst yourselves as to who's first. And then I've got uh, councillor Harvey as well. Uh, Alicia, my, my cabinet colleague, for such an impressive report and for all the officers who helped to, to prepare it. It's very clear to quote you that we have made real and substantial progress in reducing our CO2 emissions in previous financial years. In particular, highlighted in this report were financial year, was the financial year uh, 2021 to 22. But of course, it hasn't stopped there, and we're, we've heard there's a great news today about the uh, the heat pump at, um, at Pitville, at the, the leisure centre, for the, to support the pool there. That will really be a, a great game changer. But um, I'd like to draw attention briefly to what's been happening within my own portfolio of uh, waste and recycling and parks and gardens and street services, which in, includes uh, toilets, public toilets. Um, in specifically, I'd like to draw attention to the two electric vans which have been funded by CBC for use by the green space ground maintenance and toilet maintenance crews. They're supported by uh, full charging points, eight indeed, at the Borough Council depot, and the two vehicles have been operational since May. And then meanwhile, since October... CBC's waste and recycling vehicles have stopped using traditional diesel and have now been moving across to use hydro-treated <coughs> vegetable oil, which is HVO, and uh, it's also known as renewable diesel, perhaps you know it by that terminology, which is 87% cleaner than traditional diesel, especially with regard, to, with regard to particulates. So the bottom line on this is that through these actions, we have reduced carbon emissions, and this is this year, by more than 220 tonnes of, of CO2. So we, we continue to make progress on this front. It doesn't stop there. Thank you. Councillor Hallwood. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Mayor. Um, I would like to congratulate the uh, Cabinet member as well, although congratulate hardly comes close uh, in a way because it is absolutely fantastic that we declared a climate emergency and that we set out a pathway to net zero. It's fantastic that we didn't just let that declaration you know, sit on a shelf somewhere. We have actually gone to the trouble of producing this very scientifically led carbon footprinting report that really analyzes whether we are doing what we said we would do. It's fantastic that we are doing what we said we would do and that the progress is, if anything, for the council at least, if not the, the wider town, even faster than we projected in that pathway. Uh, and that she has reported such uh, fantastic progress and more measures as well, like the Leisure At um, uh, initiative today as well. But so amongst all that, I would forgive her for, me, for not highlighting something that I'm going to draw councillors' attention to, which is very on page 94 of your paperwork. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you've read it all, but just in case, which is that if anything, this presents a conservative picture because the electricity declared which we buy from something called West Mercia Energy, which is a kind of uh, consortium arrangement, um, is based on what's called uh, location-based methodology. In other words, it takes grid average. So on the basis that you know, a proportion of our electricity 
uh, or of electricity in general at this location comes from zero carbon sources and a proportion doesn't, it allocates, I think, 32 uh, tonnes of uh, the equivalent of CO2 as our carbon footprint for that electricity. But in practice, we buy from West Mercia Energy what is called uh, a pure green tariff. So arguably, if we took it on a, um, a market-based reporting method, we could actually claim that that carbon footprint was zero for that electricity, even better than is reported on the headline figures. And that's because we took the commitment to buy green energy and green electricity. And it's, um, I mean, I'm, in a way, I think it's absolutely right that we should take a conservative approach to the way we present the numbers and take a pessimistic view, if you like. Uh, but in a way, there is even better news hidden in this report. And again, another example of how a Lib Dem Council is taking real initiatives to protect the environment and to reduce our carbon footprint. And as I said, I, uh, congratulation hardly, hardly does the job, but I absolutely congratulate the Cabinet Member for bringing forward such a positive report. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. And of course, that's the Cabinet Member for Climate, something which the opposition parties didn't want to have. So I'd congratulate the, the councillor for being, being in that position. And also the other councillors from the Cabinet giving highlights of where this council <coughs> is going towards carbon neutral for the future. Um, I'd like to thank whoever it was that dreamt up the carbon literacy training for all councillors. Um, and this is part of my, uh, my pledge to use e-scooters more often than I was anyway. Um, what I'd like to do, though, is complain about the weather because nobody said it was going to be raining when I came hurtling into town from Charlton Kings. So I thank you for that. Councillor Baker has touched on his thanks as a, um, a board member of the, of the Lido Trust, um, stealing my funder about the, the Cheltenham Trust and the heat pump exchange at the Prince of Wales Stadium. Um, sorry, at the Leisure At. Um, it's a pity that um, the person that made the comment about the Leisure At and lack of funding and so on from agenda item nine had left the chamber to hear the cabinet members say that the, the good news about the heat pump coming to Leisure At. This is a commitment that Cheltenham Borough Council has got to our, our, our infrastructure of properties that we own. I have a non-pecuniary interest in the trust as a board member, that's already been declared, but as a board member I'd like to say thank you to, to the cabinet member for getting, uh, getting that through. I know that um, Laurie and the rest of the trust will be really delighted to hear that, but it's really indicative of uh, the fact that we do look across our portfolio of obligations and we do try and move in the right direction. And if you could do something about the weather and raining next time on my e scooter, that'd be absolutely brilliant. Uh, I know you'll be doing that next week, but I'd just like to thank the cabinet member for, uh, for highlighting that. Councillor Alderstow. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd just like to uh, say thank you to, to councillors for bringing this report to us today. And um, just to say that as cabinet member for housing, um, Councillor Finn pointed out that the Cheltenham Borough Homes. Uh, uh, insight has been removed from this particular report, but I can tell you firsthand through the recently published um, Housing Revenue Account five year business plan last month that this has been taken extremely seriously um, and that with the council and Channel Borough Homes, we have already um, gone through the, um, the, the various funding. Um, pots for the social housing decarbonation fund and that we are in the process of uh, going for the next round so I really hope that we're, we're successful in that but you know in terms of our fabric first approach in existing homes um, the funding currently for the social housing decarbonation decarbonization fund is only up to a, a level C EPC C and obviously, we really need to get to B's and A's. So um, we really are very reliant as, as a council on um, more central funding from government. So I'm really looking forward to that coming, coming through. Um, but with regards to um, Cheltenham Borough Homes and um, being scrutinised, they have their own board. Um, and as cabinet member, we have a, a cabinet member for housing working group, cross-party support from all um, um, members being able to contribute and scrutinise. And uh, Cheltenham Borough Homes is often presenting there. And we also have our social housing decarbonisation fund um, and uh, meetings around that, and also with senior officers. So there, there is plenty of collaboration, and we're all working towards the same goal. It's the set in our corporate plan. Thank you. Oops. Thank you. Did I see a hand uh, over there? Councillor Thank you. Um, 
Thank you for the, for the report. And, and it just uh, made me think about just how complex and how critical um, th this, um, this portfolio is. And I was going to make the same point as, as Councillor Harvey uh, about the need for, for a cabinet member to be actually looking after this area and working so well with, with the, uh, the officers on this. Um, but something set me off in here, and which I've mentioned maybe to you before, but I just wanted to mention it again, and that is, um, you mentioned solar power, uh, and um, certainly in my ward, we've got a lot of people who are interested in, in purchasing solar panels and such like, and whether or not there are, there's any possibility of, bulk, if we're bulk purchasing for, for the council to, to include um, our uh, residents and, and other people in the, in the town in that. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's fine if you want to do that, and then we'll... Just because that was a question, I thought it would make life easier to answer as we go. There were initial plans to look at bulk buying for residents. Unfortunately, we had some good legal advice that the scheme we were looking at wasn't the right choice for Cheltenham, so we're looking at other options, but we are keen to support residents, just not through this particular mechanism. We'll find something. I do have to take the advice of our legal team, who are excellent. It's just a, a work in progress, but thank you for bringing that up. Mayor, um, one of the things I brag about is that uh, we have so many delightfully young councillors here. And of course, <laughs> Councillor <laughs> <laughs> Lewis is our youngest and a uh, force to be reckoned with. She's done a fabulous job. But I, I just want to point something out we should consider going forward. I'm working on three initiatives along with Councillor Tailford in my ward, All, All Saints. Uh, one is a, an 83-year-old chap who's pushing me to put solar panels on the school, St John's Primary School, where I'm a, a, I'm a governor. Um, we also worked with Highbury Church, uh, on, and we invited the officer, Karen Watson, to come and speak about recycling. And uh, a, a resident, Bob Gow, has set up some retrofitting sessions so we could learn uh, in our ward. And that now has escalated. We're meeting with council officers and hoping to roll that out across Cheltenham. But the amusing thing is, so the chap who's pushing me to put solar powders on the school is 83. The median age at these groups, especially the recycling, was uh, probably... 68. So there's something very odd going on here. We need to reach young people. I agree that old people are post-war, probably those who do make their own jam, as indeed I do, and they still darn socks, as indeed I do. I make quilts from old shirts. I'm not offering my services. I'm very busy. But could we all, in our collective consciousness, take note that getting through to young people, as much as they march and they say they want to change the world, we need to engage them in future. And I think uh, Councillor Lewis is an excellent advocate to start that initiative. Councillor Clark, Councillor Flynn. Um, thank you. Um, I, I do welcome this report. Uh, it's quite right that uh, Cheltenham declared a climate emergency, as over 570 other councils have done. And, uh, and it, it's, it's right that we, we do take this seriously. And I welcome the report. I would like to look at how we use all our parks and green spaces, though, of which we have many, um, for things like ground source heat pumps. So I wondered if that could uh, be noted. Thank you. Councillor Lewis. Sorry, okay. <laughs> <My apologies. laughs> I have to speak through the chair, quite literally in that case. So just on the point about the use of our parks and gardens for heat pumps, always excited looking at all the options. We've got an initial sort of short list of things we're working on, but once we work through that initial stage, happy to consider it for the next round. Is there any other member who wishes to uh, 
Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you, Mayor. I, I will be brief, I promise. Um, as the member who brought forward the climate emergency declaration a few years ago, um, I think it's just important for us all to reflect on the pace of change and how it is quickening. Clearly, this report shows that over the last year we have reduced our uh, internal carbon emissions significantly. And uh, one of the things I've discovered as a councillor here over the last nine years or so is that change in the public sector does not take place at breakneck speed. But over the last year, we clearly have done things um, very, very well. And uh, it is, uh, I think, to the credit of the climate team, so Mike is sitting at the back of the room here, but also Laura uh, and Alex and Maisie as well, um, that, uh, that actually we're showing really good progress and the pace of change is quickening in this area. Um, I think we need to go further and we need to go faster and we need to see the pace of change uh, outside of this building quickening too. And uh, while we are doing very well at measuring stuff internally and what gets measured gets done, um, I think we ought to all uh, refresh and renew our commitment uh, in everything that we do to assess climate uh, as well and climate change. While doing so, of course, not saying that this gives us a free reign to sort of become part of a stop the world coalition where we, we say nothing ever happens ever again in Cheltenham for the risk of producing another gram or two of carbon emissions, but do it in a way that brings our residents along with us and see ourselves as members and officers as enablers of that change and people who encourage that change. Uh, and if we all do that, I'm certain that the pace of change over time will quicken outside of this building as it is inside of this building in our carbon emissions. So thank you very much. I would commend the report and I would say well done to Councillor Lewis who succeeded me in a role uh, which is extremely challenging um, and, and presents many barriers to change. Um, but we are smashing them all down thanks to the work of Mike, Alex, Laura, Maisie, Alicia and all of the rest of us here because we all have a responsibility to this. We can't slope our shoulders. We've seen at other levels of government people suggesting that international problems are not anything that reaches this shore and it's not something that we have to engage with. This authority is outward looking and outward facing thanks to its progressive liberal leadership. And, uh, and I know that even in parties opposite, who are not in the Liberal Democrat group, that mission is shared. And I think it's really important that all of us do our bit. And I know that we are. So well done to everyone who's been part of this. And Alicia, I know that you'll continue to move even quicker next year. Thank you. Any other member? No? Okay, so uh, Councillor Lewis, is there anything further you wish to add? Yes, just a couple of things. Firstly, I want to count, thank Councillor Harvey for supporting our investment at Leisure At. I'm also very excited. I think one of the great things about being able to be the Cabinet Member for Climate Change is that I do get to invest and find ways of investing in keeping the things that Cheltenham loves, the things that make Cheltenham great sustainable for my children, your children, their children. If we don't have this climate strategy, we will not be able to protect the things that we love. And I think the investment at Leisure Act is just one opportunity on that strength to keep things that we love going into the future. I'd also like to congratulate Councillor Clark on the success of her retrofitting club. I know it's very well liked and many residents bring up her incredible work on making this possible to me just in the street sometimes. She really is a local celebrity. I will, however, say that we have already started engaging with young people. I'm really glad and I've really enjoyed the opportunity to speak to young people across Cheltenham, including at student events and events with children in the local schools. I've learned a lot from them and I've taken some really interesting ideas that they've come up with back to this council to explore. So I'm really glad that our climate strategy does involve young people and make them feel that they can have a voice in this process. Thank Councillor Wilkinson for his impatience on this climate strategy. It is one that I share and I look forward to being able to share even more progress that we're making in the pipeline. Local government is not a speedy place. I am, however, young enough to stay the course. So <laughs> I will see it done one way or another. I would also say that I was remiss to forget to thank Councillors Horwood and Councillors Wilkinson for their incredible support and great wisdom in supporting me in taking this report to Council. And I am 
as always, incredibly grateful to them. So thank you, colleagues. I commend this report, and I hope we are all on the same page when it comes to tackling this serious climate crisis. Thank you. So we'll move to the vote on the recommendation. If members could use the electronic system. Right, I'll start again. We'll move on to agenda item 11, which is notices of motion. So we've got motion A, which is proposed by Councillor Flynn. And Councillor Joy, are you seconding that motion? Right, Councillor Flynn, would you like to, to speak? In uh, 1997, Cheltenham Borough Council initiated a programme of work called Investment in Young People, a strategic framework which recommended the creation of a youth affairs post to deliver actions outlined in the strategy. These included the formation of a youth council and making a difference, Young People's Council was born. Right here, right now, a strategy for young people was, improved, was approved in 2001 and further developed the arguments for creating opportunities for young people to engage with Cheltenham Borough Council. It stressed the need for the Council to work with its partners to help young people develop the skills needed to ensure they have influence. It looked to ensure young people could become active citizens in their communities and through the ballot box. The Right Here, Right Now strategy noted that all young people suffered a disadvantage through a lack of influence in decision making. The strategy focused on the 10 to 19 year old age group, but involved some work with young people outside of that age range. The strategy's basic principle was to involve young people in decision making from the earliest possible stage in their lives and demonstrated a commitment to Article 12 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which gives young people a fundamental right to participate in all decisions that affect them and to ensure that their views are given due weight. In February 2003, a report of the Community and Youth Development Manager went to this Council Social and, Overview, uh, Social and Community Overview and Scrutiny Committee. According to the minutes, uh, the current councillors Seacombe, Holiday, Barnes and Wheeler were in attendance at that meeting. Uh, the review of the agenda for young people highlighted the work of the Youth Council, which included wide-ranging consultation with other young people through questionnaires, surveys, campaigns and more. The paper stated that Cheltenham Borough Council was addressing the issue in the democratic deficit of young people through a strategy for young people, having a youth council representative of an overview and scrutiny, having youth spokespersons from each party who work and meet with the Young People's Council on a regular basis, by introducing officers to the Young People's Council through presentations at youth council meetings, development of a draft youth policy, developing training for officers and members who may need to consult with young people based on ethical guidelines. The Making a Difference Young People's Council was initially funded from GCC Cash, um, but after GCC took youth service back in-house, CBC had to reassess the Youth Council's future. From 2008 until 2011, it was funded via a community investment grant of £15,000 per annum. In the Cabinet meeting of the 18th of January 2011, Cabinet members noted that a full-time post to support the Youth Council had been deleted two years previously, and that Cheltenham Borough Council had been funding a part-time role through, through the County Youth Service. Cabinet decided to cease funding and young people have been denied a vehicle for meaningful engagement with this council since. The corporate plan mentions No Child Left Behind and says that through it, this council will continue to raise awareness of issues affecting children such as criminal exploitation, period poverty or healthy eating. Nowhere does it mention actively involving young people in decisions and policy making. There is no commitment 
to giving young people an influence in decision making in our corporate plan. Passing this motion makes that commitment. I'm pleased that there is a focus on the views of young people in the draft culture strategy uh, to the extent that there's a recommendation to have a young person sit on the board. The culture board is made up of representatives from many different organisations. Its stance on including young people in everything it does is one which this council should follow and one I am very grateful for. Searching CBC documents will find little mention of children and young people and their democratic participation in any of this council's business since about 2011. I've spent many hours looking and it would seem that when funding for the successful Young People's Council was discontinued, the importance of giving young people a democratic voice was relegated to the back of minds. Last month, six councillors accepted the invitation to come to the chamber to hear from Cheltenham's Youth Climate Group, a group independent of this council. We heard that Cheltenham Borough Council turned down the opportunity to support the highly successful Interclimate Network Young People Survey in Gloucestershire. Fortunately, Dr Martin stepped in with sponsorship. We also heard that young people don't feel represented in power-holding structures, that there should be an integration of youth voices in the decision-making process and a structure for long-term participation for young people. When Overview and Scrutiny reported back to this council after looking at the UNICEF child-friendly city status and no child left behind in some depth, some depth, it was clear that there is not currently a mechanism for young people to influence what the council does. Stride District Youth Council was founded in 2000 by Stride District Council. District Youth Councillors acted as representatives of their community, advocating the issues faced by young people in the area. The Youth Council and nine locality-based youth forums represent the views of young people, enabling them to collectively use their right to have a voice and to be heard on relevant issues of concern. They engage with decision makers to influence change and make a positive contribution to improving the lives of people in the communities they represent. They interact with elected district members, in particular political group leaders. They interact with county councillors and members of parliament. They are involved in Stroud District Council's performance monitoring um, in policy and in strategy work. They have focus groups for topics such as health and well-being, democracy, anti-bullying, young people's rights and nodal transport. And they are a member of the British Youth Council. I would recommend that councillors take a look at their website for evidence of the positive impact Stride's commitment to giving young people uh, a voice has had. A youth council be can be formed and set up in many different ways as the information found by following the link submitted with the motion shows. What it will look like is for the young people of this town to lead on. All members are being asked to do today is to vote to start the journey to give young people in Cheltenham a vehicle for their voices to be truly heard. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Councillor Joy, did you want to speak now or reserve your rights? I'd like to speak now just because I've, I've got a short speech prepared. Um, so essentially, based on um, this motion, we feel that there are many strong options to generally improving democratic engagement with young people. Um, you know, it's important to both um, treat, to kind of both um, approach those who can't legally vote but are still citizens of our country and our local community, but those who are able to vote but don't really know how everything works, how things relate to one another. So we've identified that there's obviously a key need for and an appetite for engagement as well. People want to get involved. Um, it's just about empowering them in ways that they can practically do that. Um, a lot of us will probably have found talking to our constituents that people generally value democracy. They value the opportunity to pitch in and they want to participate. So we kind of just want to make sure that it's easy to do that. It's accessible to do that. Um, it's something that we can do kind of every day, every week, just in a structured way without life getting in the way of that. I mean, even something as simple as students being unsure whether they can vote in their university or at their hometown, you know, it's, it's just sort of clarification on these measures would make such a big difference. And there are some really strong mechanisms that we can use that would be very cost effective and wouldn't be too time consuming to just inform people. Um, there's also the issue that um, many young people actually tend to move across wide areas settling into their careers, the, the fact that they don't necessarily stay in the towns that they grew up in. And actually, this is another element. We would, it would be really good to empower people who were brought up in Cheltenham in the Cheltenham area 
and just enable them to kind of like grow roots, roots in their community, just make, make sure that they're incentivized to, to stick around. So I'm aware that there are going to be burdens, burdens on officers' time with this and um, operating costs are a concern. The fact that we've lost national-based funding, obviously like, that's going to be an impact on this. But um, in some ways, we kind of really just want to start the ball rolling. We, we, we are hearing that there's an appetite. We want to act on it. And um, the stakes are quite high. It's, it's just making sure that people actually do have opportunities to engage. So hopefully this can be an iterative process. It can be something that once started, we can kind of, you know, contribute to incrementally. Um, it's something that all parties could potentially do at their discretion. It doesn't necessarily have to be a CBC focused project, but it could be something that political groups take on. Um, I mean, the fact that we do have representation of a sort, it's really good that we have younger councillors in their 20s, but the thing is that according to 2021 census data, around 19% of Cheltenham's population of 118,800 people, they're aged 15 to 29, this is the age group that we want to approach. The thing is it's 7.5% of CBC council members fall within that same range, so you know, in, in order to be kind of truly representative, we kind of need to evaluate this. Um, the thing is, it's really great we already have an accessibility forum to include people with disabilities. Um, it's really, really good that we are, you know, working to address all these ambitious racial and cultural equity measures as well. But, you know, it makes sense to include young people in outreach work as well. So, um, while it's not really appropriate for me as a 33-year-old, again, falling outside that range, um, the thing is that there are measures that have been adopted elsewhere very successfully. We just need to start up and they don't cost too much money, hopefully. So things like work experience placements for school pupils, you know, just giving support, attending CBC meetings and asking questions, helping, like creating sort of like strategy groups where people can suggest motions or, you know, strategies for, um, you know, uh, CBC to follow and sort of requests that we can raise to GCC as well. Um, if there could be representation restored to CBC committees, I know that overview and scrutiny used to have youth reps, so that's something that could be quite simply reinstated. Um, learning about specific mechanisms of Chatham Borough Council oversight, um, you know, some of our partners, including Ubico, planning regulations, things like that would be really great. Um, supported invitations to county council meetings and general information sessions, shadowing councillors, officers conducting casework, of course, in accordance with data protection and privacy m measures. Feeding into consultations or panels about lived experience, um, including cost of living or transport issues, and just um, actually empowering people to be able to share what they've learned with other people in their community, their friends, family, social groups, their schools. I think it just kind of really well equips people for actually, you know, both absorbing information and kind of giving back to their community. So it's it's a long term investment, and um, you know, it, it's if we're feeling hopeful and optimistic for the future, I think that this is something that we really want to give some consideration to. So thanks. Thank you, Councillor Joy. Councillor Tailford. I, um, I have an amendment seconded by Councillor Chidley, if that's okay. Um, I think you should have a copy of it. Councillor Chidley is the seconder. Okay. Right, the amendment is now behind me and in front of me. Would you like to speak to the amendment then, Councillor Tailford? Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. And as a, a young-ish uh, councillor, I thank councillors uh, Flynn and Joy for bringing this initial motion forward. As you've mentioned in your speeches, it's important to get the ball rolling to actually make a difference here. Um, I want to present this um, amended motion as it gives us more scope to find the right solution for Cheltenham and our young people. I was also at the Climate Youth Survey event held in the Chamber in February, and the response there solidified my long-held belief that we need to do more across the UK to engage young people in democracy, particularly at a time where they feel increasingly disenfranchised. There are two problems, really. There's the 18 to 25-year-olds who are rightfully fed up nationally um, and therefore less likely to take part locally. But then there are also the under-18s who, for the most part, have zero say in our voting system currently. This is what we can try and address with this motion. At the Climate Youth Survey, and subsequently, I've been speaking to Megan Land from Stroud District Youth Council to find out more about how the Youth Council works for them in Stroud as the only one in the county. 
um, and how much it costs their council as well. This seems important to determine if it's actually feasible here at the moment um, in that format. For officer time, including qualified youth workers as well as transport, but excluding the cost of vehicles, uh, the general cost I'm told for them is around £125,000 a year for Stroud. This figure is surely out of reach for us during the current financial crisis to commit to, so I think it would be wrong to commit to the Youth Council about investigating ways of doing it in a more affordable and more sustainable way for Cheltenham and its taxpayers. The worst thing we could do is offer something to people, get these young people excited and involved and engaged, and then rip it out from under them because it costs too much. That would not help young people to feel engaged and would simply do the opposite. Councillor Boys and I have been looking into ways that youth councils work in other places as well to see their methods, to see if that's appropriate, if it costs less than it does for Stroud. I think this is important to find a long-term solution for Cheltenham. What we also need to consider is the fact that we have plenty of young people that may not want to take part in a youth council. So how do we get them involved too? Despite being a councillor now, I probably wouldn't have when I was under 18. So, so it's important we engage all of those people as well. We need to make sure that the options that are chosen are implemented and implemented are the best for Cheltenham and its young people and that they have a long-term future as part of our council. Not a quick fix for a headline, a long-term solution to help our young people to feel engaged and have a genuine say in the future of our town. It may be a youth council, and I per personally hope that some sort of solution to that would work, but it may be that another option is more suitable for engagement and long-term sustainability. It may be that we find multiple different solutions to combine together that can work in tandem with existing initiatives across the town. If this amended motion gets passed, I'm looking forward to offering any help I can in working for our young people. Thank you. Is, if, I mean, the amendment is obviously not simply sending it to Cabinet, um, and yet the, the amendment negates the motion. Um, it has changed the motion to a point at which it isn't the motion it was, uh, and has negated it. Um, too complicated, the technology, obviously. Um, yeah, uh, thank, thank you, Madam Mayor. Th thank you, Councillor Flynn. Um, I think that the... Um, I was going to um, let the, the, the seconder speak to, to the amendment, um, and then I was actually going to come in on this, this one and say, I think, um, actually, the um, amendment seeks to uh, refer the motion to the Cabinet for some further explanation... I don't think it negates the motion entirely because it talk, does talk about the Youth Council being an option, but it talks about there need to be costs and consideration of that, which I think is um, acceptable and a valid point. It would be um, irrational and probably um, challenging for the Council to resolve to agree to something that they've got absolutely no understanding of the implications of that at this moment in time. So I think my advice would be that the motion should stand referred to the Cabinet for further consideration. Um, sorry, so that would be uh, under 13.12, an amendment to the motion so to refer the matter to appropriate bodies. Being the Cabinet, yes. but that would be to refer the motion as, as uh, proposed by myself. Um, yes, yeah, so the motion would be referred, as you submitted it, to Cabinet for them to consider. The, amend the, part, the thing that's put forward as the amendment can be part of that wider consideration because obviously the work that the Cabinet will probably do is probably going to be to look at the Youth Council as, an, as a whole piece of work and then bring it back to Council for a debate on it. Does that make sense? Um, 
Uh, I'm sorry, I understood it as, as that the motion would go as it stood and just it would the, that the amendment according to the constitution under 13.12 would be that the amendment would be to send it to the cabinet and that's it. Um, otherwise, it then comes down to adding in words and leaving out words and then as long as the effect is not to negate the motion and the motion is to establish a youth council and this amendment does not ask that um is not yeah sorry no no that's fine i think we're probably just over complicating this um so i think in some ways i think you can almost forget about what the amendment's saying what i'm saying is the motion is referred to cabinet so as it was presented there's an amendment here, but the amendment pretty much seeks to refer it to Cabinet. It says it in a long, way, rounded way, and it adds other things in. But what I'm saying is if the motion goes to Cabinet, then it will come back to Council as probably a bigger piece of work that will look at other options as well. Does that make sense? Not happy. So I think the straightforward answer is the motion is... The, the motion... The motion is now will be referred to cabinet. That's the answer. Cabinet will then do a piece of work, and then it will come back to council for a decision. Okay. Um, that, that's not my Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Councillor Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Presumably, the motion and the amendment and all of that directive travel will be go to cap will go into cabinet. Thank you. I hope our colleagues understand that position. Right. So I've been informed that this goes as it is to cabinet. No. I think in the interest of fairness, really, Councillor Chidley, if you'd like to um, if you'd like to speak to the amended motion. <laughs> Thank you very much, Councillor um, Flynn, for that. Uh, kind of taking the wind out of my sails, so to speak. But thank you, Madam Mayor. And I'd just like to say how honoured I am to make my debut in this chamber today. And um, I'm also incredibly happy for that debut to be seconding Councillor Tailford's amendment. So, nice one, Isaac. <laughs> Whilst I was running for Battle Down, I was surprised to hear so many comments about my age. A lot of them complimentary, obviously. Um, I was even reminded on BBC Radio that I am now one of the youngest serving councillors in the region, which is bonkers. But believe it or not, this is not a brag. <laughs> the fact that somebody under 30 involved in local politics is so rare is indeed a problem. Madam Mayor, I'm sure most of us can remember the YouGov so Youth Survey from 2021, which showed that young people are losing faith in democracy, and by a lot. And this is a worrying trend. So, I support the idea of a CBC platform to increase, increase youth engagement in local democracy. We need to remind the next generation of politicians that real change also occurs at a local level and not just in Westminster. However, it would be wise for this platform to be well researched and well thought through. It would need to be a long lasting solution in order to make sure that as many young people as possible gain, gain access to this sort of platform which I think will be greatly beneficial. We've just heard from a 25-year-old cabinet member today that has stolen the floor uh, with some trailblazing work. So we can just see the amount of potential we have in young people today in Cheltenham. Um, I would also like to say that any platform that the council investigates and goes into, I'd like to make sure that this is something that is inclusive of all of Cheltenham and perhaps not just by uh, some schools maybe in the east side of town. Um, I was so lucky to go to Balcarra School, which I heard that in the past 
has contributed greatly to all youth engagement, but I'd like to see that more encompassing of the whole town and maybe get something from All Saints and, and so on, etc. But uh, that's all really I had to say about it. So thank you very much. Now, I've been told the proposers and the seconders have both spoken, so we won't be entering into debate, but we need to vote on whether this needs to be or is going to um, Cabinet. So, are we using the electronic vote? Whose motion to refer are we voting on? The amendment. So we're voting on the amendment. Good. Madam Mayor, um, whilst we have, have um, asked to refer this, um, I think if members wanted to make comments, it might be um, stifling if they were prevented from doing so. I'll seek the advice of the monitoring officer. No, I, I thought that that might, come up, that might come up. I think what you need to remember here, Council, is that what, what this is doing, we're not at this point accepting or rejecting the motion per se. So we're, we're, it's being asked for it to be referred on to another, um, an, another body for consideration. Members will at the, um, be able to attend that cabinet meeting that looks at this if it's a, if it's a separate meeting. Um, and equally, when the report comes back to full council, there will be a full debate on it then. So don't think that there can be any suggestion that anyone is stifling the debate by just not allowing it to happen now. It's just deferring the debate to another time. Thank you. Is everybody clear? OK. Are we using uh, the electronic system or is it a show of hands? We'll use the electronic voting system. Thank you. So that has been carried, um, 31 for two abstentions. So that will be referred to Cabinet and then come back to full council in due course. We'll now move on to motion B. So the proposer is Councillor Joy. Um, Councillor Flynn, you're going to second this motion, is that correct? Councillor Joy, would you like to speak to the motion? So um, basically my motion proposal is um, to request that in Venice the CBC investment holdings um, are quite limited but this is primarily to address the issue of pensions managed by Gloucestershire County Council and to call for divestment um, of any fossil fuel holdings which re represent around 5% of um, pensions holdings. Um, bless you. Bless, based on a 2.2% billion pound fund total based on a report published in February 2021 there was um, the proportion 4.4 percent fossil fuels um, by a hundred, representing 100 million pounds um, through either direct investments for example directly held shares in a fossil fuel company like BP or Shell or indirect investments through investment funds basically coal represented um, nearly 38 million Oil and gas represented 62 million almost. So the thing is that um, some of those who read the news may be aware that the IPCC report came through today. It's um, the final stage of the climate report that they've been preparing over a number of years and they've basically said that um, in terms of climate breakdown, it's now or never. So um, a lot of people will be taking climate change as seriously as it deserves to be taken. 
um, I myself in a more direct frame work on the audit committee. So um, I spend a lot of time reflecting on risk management. It is quite overwhelming. It's very difficult to predict the effect the climate breakdown will end up having on us as individuals or as, you know, in a wider society in years to come in concert with other variables. So we only ever can do the best of what we have. There are even maybe people in this room or listening to this meeting who aren't fully convinced about human-driven climate change, despite around 99% of the international scientific community and con consensus about the impact that the global north has been having on our planet's atmosphere. And we can see that there is like profound negative impact of fossil fuel use, both locally and worldwide. We can see the impact of air pollution. I mean, the fact that um, some, like many of the heritage buildings in Cheltenham that are whitewashed are grimy from exhaust pipe emissions. We can see that oil spills occur almost daily um, from pipelines or, you know, from, um, you know, like spillages at sea. Anyone could tell you what an oil spill's effect on wildlife would be for one thing. And just, just the fact that we can see these very direct results of fossil fuel dependency, it's something that we need to have a discussion about. The thing is that ultimately, while it's not CBC who are managing the pensions funds directly, it's really important that we actually do take measures to make sure that the money being invested on our behalf by um, Gloucestershire County Council is actually being invested responsibly. Um, anyone who's a special in, specialist in this will say that you know there's there's an ambiguity between stranded assets where you know effectively you know that the pace of um, renewables uptake actually means that um, fossil fuel assets are left behind and that they completely lose their value or even descend into the negatives, which would leave us holding the bucket for that. Um, but in the meantime, we'll also have been losing out on the opportunities that renewables would have invested, in, like, you know, actually afforded us as an alternative. The thing is, while I was growing up, there was actually a persistent assumption that someday the oil would run out. I mean, it's a limited resource. It's effectively ancient forests that have been densely compressed in over millions of years into energy-rich carbon deposits, but we're not going to have any or more of those. Instead, now, of instead of all of that stuff just magically appearing again, we're just using more desperate and destructive ways to, um, to accrue these sorts of supplies. You can see the tar sands of Alberta, the fact that the proposed Willow project in the Arctic is being discussed now, is only now possible for humans to access because of glacial melt in the Arctic, so we can actually get there. Oil fields in the Niger Delta or Ecuador. You know, the, the thing is that this stuff might be out of sight, out of mind for a lot of us. Pension schemes seem very dry, but they do have a material impact on you know, many places throughout the globe, and we just need to make sure that we're taking our due diligence for it. Um, the thing is that, um, based, based at CBC um, in Cheltenham, most of our reserves generally are ring fen fen fenced with restrictions. So, there's I have reservations about how viable it is for us to divest. But the thing is that um, our strategy is reviewed every three years. There are opportunities for re-evaluation. And in the meantime, focusing more directly on the Gloucestershire Pension Fund Investment Strategy Statement um, that was dated 8th of December 2022, it was noted on page 10 that the fund will not seek to exclude investments that are not barred by UK law in the belief that engagement is preferable to divestment. This essentially boils down to just asking fossil fuel providers nicely if they will sort themselves out and actually stop causing harm. And that's not good enough anymore. We're, we're seeing, you know, the impact that the war in Ukraine is having. We can see that there's, you know, long-term environmental responsibility that's being deferred in favour of short-term profits. As long as money, as long as these firms are being funded, then there's money being diverted to them that explicitly supports them in their behaviours. And it just doesn't seem to be worth it anymore. Um, just the way we're enabling this short, destructive short-termism, it's, it's not responsible. The, the, for most of these corporations, the core business model is to simply create profits that aren't actually driven back into renewable energy alternatives. There are measures that we can request, and I would really like CBC to request those of Gloucestershire County Council, creating a task force for climate-related disclosures regulations, such as, as Cornwall has a dedicated responsible investment officer such as the Oxfordshire Council. The fact is that we don't need to wait for national laws to change before we examine the impact and responsibility that we have. Um, essentially, the primary aim that we want to achieve as quickly as possible, and the situation is very urgent, is monitoring 
and promoting environmental, social and governance investment by the pension funds that are at our disposal. So I would really like to call on my colleagues to weigh this up very carefully and just try to make sure we're doing our due diligence, as I've said. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just going over to the monitoring officer who um, is seeking clarification. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Just a, a quick, just want to clarify something you just said, said there, Councillor Joy, if I may. You mentioned something about a task force. Was that the council setting up a task force? Oh, that would be Chef, possibly. Right. So I would like us to write to the GCC task force. That's not what the motion says. Request that all pensions managed by Gloucestershire County Council are similarly divested in a responsible way. That was mostly a suggestion for what we could recommend, essentially. That's fine. Second the motion. Do you want to speak now or reserve your rights? Um, I, I will just speak now. Um, I think um, Councillor Joy has covered, covered most things, really. Um, fossil fuel divestment aims to reduce carbon emissions by accelerating the adoption of the renewable energy transition through the stigmatisation of fossil fuel companies. This includes putting public pressure on companies that are currently involved in fossil fuel extraction to invest in renewable energy. Um, it, it's an attempt to reduce climate change by exerting pressure uh, for the institutional divestment of assets, including stocks, bonds, and other financial instru instruments connected to com companies involved in extracting fossil fuels. Why is this important to Cheltenham Borough Council? Corporate plan, key priority to net zero Cheltenham, says that we strongly believe that in order to ask others to make the necessary changes to their organisations and lives, we must be seen to be leading on making these changes ourselves. I would go further and say that we shouldn't just be seen to be leading on making these changes. We should lead. And this includes a stance we take on both our own investments and that of the County Council's <coughs> pensions. We should be leading on this to set an example to businesses and individuals in the town. We declared a climate emergency nearly four years ago now. Plenty of time to move investments away from fossil fuels. Yet we heard in last month's meeting that this council still hasn't completely done that. The County Council declared a climate emergency the month before we did. They too have had nearly four years. It's too long. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I have an amendment to make. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank Councillor Joy and Councillor Flynn for bringing this motion forward. I'm sure we all recognise that as local councillors, being held to account is an important part of politics. It enables us to match the rhetoric with action. And nothing is more important to this council than our commitment to the planet. Every day, I am reminded that I will leave this planet to my children, uh, and it's incumbent on me to do better and for us all to reach uh, new standards together. So when I say thank you uh, for bringing this motion forward, I truly and sincerely mean it. So about three years ago, this council committed uh, to the climate emergency. Since that time, we have looked at everything we can do through an entirely new lens. I dare say that no one in this chamber will claim uh, that we've, we've done everything we can. Net zero is the ultimate challenge, and we must continually review uh, our efforts in order to move to a better future. As part of our stated aim uh, towards net zero, I want to reiterate our commitment to divest from organisations involved in the production of fossil fuels. And over recent years, we have done a huge amount uh, to achieve this. As I speak, um, or at the end of February, the equities we hold in organisations focused on fossil fuels account for less than 1%, that is 0.7% of our overall investment portfolio. But as I stated, our commitment is to make that zero. These equities are part of a larger pooled investment, which is managed as a fund. 
Currently, this fund returns £120,000 per year into the council's budget, which we use towards local services. Um, more so, due to market conditions, uh, leaving this fund now would result in significant losses of around about £383,000. Um, so this, if we were to remove ourselves from this fund, we would incur financial losses and we would have to make cuts to local services. To mitigate uh, this financial burden, our financial advisors, the Treasury, uh, financial officers and our Treasury Ma Management Committee um, have been closely monitoring the market conditions and will exit from this fund at the earliest opportunity. Of course, we would prefer to make this uh, change immediately, uh, but whilst we are in a challenging environment of rising inflation and ever-decreasing support from our government, we owe it to residents to exit in a controlled manner. Finally, turning to our staff pension arrangements, as you are aware, pension schemes are held and managed by Gloucestershire County Council. We know the, the County Council is also committed to net zero, so we will be pleased to organise a briefing for all members so they can demonstrate their commitment to divesting from fossil fuels. Thank you. Councillor Jeffries, your second in the amendment. Would you like to speak to it now? Pardon? The proposer of this um, motion, do you accept the amendments? Sorry, can, again, it's a point of order, really, because the, the, the original motion um, makes, a, you know, a clear request, and the amendment is very different from that, and it's, uh, it's, it's the amendment is, let's invite someone from the county to talk to us. That is not, that is very different from what this motion says. And I believe that that amendment has again negated the motion. Um, Can I just add something as well? Is, is this, is it possible for instead of this to be an amendment? Can they just submit it as their own motion? could submit it as a motion but not today because it's uh, not been given on no not been given on notice but I think when I, uh, when I read that as a whole so you've got the resolution at the bottom but when I read the amendment as a whole there are very some things in there that are very similar to the original motion so it talks about um, for example the commitment to divest from um, f funds which include fossil fuels it talks about the fact that there is already a um, a decision for that no new investment in fossil fuels will be undertaken, which is sort of aligning with the first bit of the original motion. Um, the second bit of the motion is to request, obviously, that the pensions managed by the county council are divested. I think what the suggestion here is is that um, we ask them to come in and explain how they are doing that. So I'm not sure that that negates what you're asking. I think it's just asking them to come and explain how they're doing what you want them to do. I mean, it, it's, it's good to have this sort of discussion just so we can see where we're all at. The thing is that inviting a representative from GCC, like, I think that that's a good idea. But the thing is that what do we then subsequently do? You can appreciate that I have a sense of general urgency with this. You know, I, I understand that, you know, in some ways there are fiscal concerns to us transferring our investments in this way. But, like, I, the planet is literally dying, like, are we debating in terms of that? Like, it's still something that's really imperative. You know, the, the thing is that ultim ultimately, you know, we, we, we may be quite, you know, we're, we're basically in this position where we're time poor, we're time, we're time poor as well. We don't have time, we don't have money. What is the responsible thing for us to be doing here? If people believe, if, if the proposers of this 
amendment believe that what I have submitted isn't appropriate. Then they should vote against it. Yeah, you can just vote against it and propose your own motion that you feel is more adept. You know, if I'm happy to be wrong on something. Well, I'm going over to the monitoring officer. So clearly I'm not going to get involved in the politics of, you know, what you're, what you're saying about, you know, the planet and the debate and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think that there is a challenge here in that requesting the county council, you could make a similar argument. So actually we can't direct them to do it. It's, you know, what they do with their investments is, is almost some respects is a bit of a matter for them. But I think what is being suggested in the amendment is that there's already been um, a decision from county to um, move towards net zero. The assumption from that, rightly or wrongly, is that you know, they will be looking at the, how they're divesting. So the amendment is asking them to come in and explain to us how they are doing that. That will give an opportunity to ask them questions and to actually probably drive it forward in a much more, um, I don't want to say forceful manner, but to, to, to actually have the, that challenging conversation, um, you know, is, is probably beneficial. So in some ways, can I assume that this would be the beginning of a longer term discussion with Gloucestershire County Council about this, or would it just be one meeting and then done? Good morning, Madam Mayor. Uh, it, seems to be a, it seems to be a debate with the monitoring officer right now, and it, it doesn't seem to be negating the rest of the council. I'd just like to bring that to your attention. I think the monitoring officer was just trying to set the record straight as to how we proceed with this. Her advice is invaluable, and I'm still unclear, so I'm waiting for the next round. <laughs> So, the amendment stands and we're now entering into debate. Councillor Willingham. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'll just start by reading, reading some um, text. So, um, it says, this is in terms of Cheltenham Borough Council, it says, we are committed in the longer, longer term to divesting from oil and gas, but need to balance these priorities with ensuring we are making right financial decisions to safeguard our residents, businesses and communities. We will continue to closely monitor the performance of this fund and when it is financially prudent to do so, we'll consider the climate implications of how we invest this money in the future. Um, the same piece of, uh, same paragraph also notes that the capital, the current capital value of the fund is, for, is valued £419,000 less than the original two million pounds invested. And that is on page 67 of today's agenda that the Green Party, um, along with everyone in this, in this council, just voted in favour of because it was a unanimous decision. So you've just voted for this. Um, the problem, let me just access some other notes. The problem with a lot of the Green Party policies is they seem to have, like their now recently rescinded policy to leave NATO, um, they flounder when they come into contact with what is best called real politic, i.e. reality. Um, you could, if you had wished to, have brought forward an amendment to the budget um, at the last meeting and asked us to divest from this and told us where you would have um, made £419,000 worth of, of cuts. Um, because as you're no doubt aware, there is a requirement, a legal requirement on this council to set a balanced budget. Um, I think that's all I need to say. There is a problem here. Yeah, if, if you want to divest now, um, tell us where you're going to make the uh, £419,000 worth of cuts and how that will um, affect us. This needs to be done in a planned and managed way, not a one paragraph motion that really isn't backed up in the legalities of the finances of this council, and in fact any local authority. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have Councillor Baker next. 
Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. I mean, I think we've all got massive sympathy with the uh, original motion. All local authorities, without exception, have got investments in fossil fuels. Brighton Council, which is green-led, um, has investments in coal, oil and gas. And they, like us, have been trying to reduce those investments over a period of time. And that is what we are doing. We have already started that process. We are on that road. Brighton is on that road too. But they, like us, realise you cannot just afford to dump them overnight at a substantial cost to the ratepayer. If the Greens, Green Party really want to do this, tell us how you're going to fund the £400,000 shortfall. I'd be quite interested to hear. The way to deal with this um, is actually to propose a motion at County Council, and actually I'm quite minded to do that as a County Councillor, um, to propose that motion at County Council, uh, and just to see what the response will be there. And the response will be the same. The response will be, we are trying to reduce our holdings in fossil fuel, but it's not something that you can do overnight for the reasons I've just explained. Brighton have got the problem, we've got the problem, every local authority has got the problem. And we're all trying to divulge, get out of this disgusting, filthy industry. But unfortunately, it cannot be done overnight. Sad. Well said. Any other member? No? Councillor Jeffries? No. Oh. Oh, sorry. Sorry, it's my turn. Yeah? Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I welcome Councillor Baker's suggestion that, that he take something to the county. Um, like, as they have had four years um, to, to, you know, be looking into this and working on this. And, and I, I accept the fact that things can't be done, you know, overnight. But four years is a significant amount of time to, to have sort of um, start to work our way out of these, these sorts of investments. Um, I mean, I do, I do wish that if members didn't like a proposal that, uh, that another group had brought, that they would just simply vote against it. Um, and if, it's, uh, if, it, if they don't want to support it, and that if they um, feel it's something of importance to them, that they bring their own motion. It is very frustrating and a waste of everybody's time um, when, when we have these, these, um, these sorts of things. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'll listen to Councillor Flynn's advice. I won't take it because that's democracy. Live with it. Um, <laughs> you, you mentioned, actually, Councillor Flynn, leadership. And leadership isn't telling people what to do, which is why the motion has been amended. Because telling the county council to divest is a wonderful, fanciful thing. And they'll go, hmm, thank you very much for that suggestion. Actually inviting them here, OK, to understand, so we can get a broader understanding of the direction of travel. Because actually, I don't understand where their direction of travel is, so I, I expect colleagues across the chamber would like to understand as well. They might be on a, a faster trajectory. We might be able to pick up some hints and tips. They might be on a slower trajectory. I don't know. This borough council's commitment is very clear. Investments that were unclean were made some time ago. And we will divest. And we won't invest in unclean investments in the future. So I welcome the amendment. Um, Councillor Bill, thank you very much for knocking to second this amendment. And I welcome the County Council um, representative from their pensions to come here and explain somewhat further as to what their direct travel is. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Right, we're now going to go to Councillor Beale. Um, if, is there anything, would you like to sum up? And then we'll go to Councillor Joy. Yeah, um, yeah sorry, happy. Um, I mean, the, 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 the summary is we are doing it. As a council, we are doing it. Um, when it comes to the County Council, we are not in control of the County Council. So we need to refer that, that matter to them and they will come back to us and give us their reaction. And hopefully, given they have a commitment to net zero, we would hope that they are doing exactly the same as we are. So, yeah, thank you. That's, that's everything on my plate. 
Thank you. Yes. Now, Councillor Joy, as proposer of the main motion, is there anything that you would like to um, add? Yeah, I would just like to say, I just want something to be done, really. It, it's, this is something that we need to discuss. We need to be realistic about. As, you know, like, as it's been, it was 2019 when climate emergencies were declared. That's literally three or four years of inaction. It gets worse all the time. Well, okay, okay, like, this is literally me just giving a speech and just, like, saying stuff that is not necessarily going to be... It, okay, right. All I, all I would like to say is that I welcome any kind of action that is in the positive, you know. I'm happy to support this amendment. I look forward to sort of seeing measures only improve as things go along, but... I'm also glad that people appreciate that this is an important issue and it's something that honestly we should be taking seriously. So, yeah. So I can accept the amendment. Yeah, I'd be happy to accept the amendment essentially if it means that something's done. Don't worry. I'm just, I'm just happy to accept the amendment if it means some forward progress. Providing it's not just one meeting, it needs to be an ongoing conversation essentially. I think, so sorry, the just, the okay, so do you accept the amendments the way that it's written? Thank you. And is that confirmed by the seconder? Yes, and can, the seconder confirms that also. Okay, in that, so in that case, we don't need to vote on the amendment. Right, so the amendment becomes the sub substantive motion. So does anybody want to debate it? <laughs> Councillor Willingham does. No. Um, just, just to um, put something on record for more for members' benefit than anything else. So the last audit of the Gloucestershire County Council pension scheme, um, the materiality, um, which is 1% of the assets, was 31 million quid, which would mean that the pension fund would be valued at 3.1 billion. Um, therefore, um, there's quite a lot of effort that would need to be undertaken to try and, um, well, understand what that is invested in and to divest. Um, and I think if we underestimate how difficult that is, then it could put a lot of um, pensioners into, um, from not just our council, but councils and public sector bodies across Gloucestershire into considerable difficulty. So um, I think it's worth members just being aware of the, the scale of the task that they are requesting Gloucestershire undertake. Thank you. Anybody got their mic? Oh, it's working again now. Um, does anybody else want to contribute to the debate? <laughs> Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think it's really good that we've got a consensus in the Chamber on this now because having continual motions coming at every council and having uh, amendments and sort of these um, in, in this Chamber, and it's unhelpful to find a consensus on the issues that we're here to deal with. Um, whether it is to do with youth councils or whether it's to do with divestment or whether it's to do with anything else that we're trying to, any other problem that we're trying to solve for our communities. Um, and, you know, it is always very easy to, to go on Google and find out some information and find out timescales and work out that it's quite awkward. Uh, Councillor Joy referenced our 2019 climate emergency declaration, it says it's too long. Uh, as I understand it, Brighton voted for divestment a couple of years before that. Um, and East Sussex County Council still hasn't divested, because there is the real world here that Councillor Willingham referenced. Nobody doubts the good intentions of this authority and its officers to deal with the climate emergency, but also we do need to carry on picking up the bins. We will need to carry on running our parks and gardens. We will need to carry on running the No Child Left Behind scheme. And if we want to set up things like youth councils, they'll need to be paid for too in due course. So we do need to do this in a structured way that works and that brings people along with us and doesn't put the rest of our operations on behalf of this town on a day-to-day -day basis at risk. So I think it's really good that we've got consensus. 
I think we've had a really good debate. We've had a good airing of the issues. I would commend Councillor Joy for her decision to take on the amendment because I think that shows that we can do proper consensus-based politics where we can work with one another. And as a liberal pluralist, I think that's the way we should operate in this chamber. We should always be looking for consensus. That is what residents expect of us. And I'm pleased that on this occasion, we've managed to find that. So well done, Councillor Joy, for bringing the motion in the first place, and Councillor Flynn. And well done to Councillor Beale for his very reasonable amendment, and to Councillor Jeffries for seconding that. And I think we can all be very pleased with what we've achieved here. And we will still have that commitment to divest at the time when it is sensible and safe for us to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Can we just have the amendment back on the screen, please, so we can see the exact... Thank you. Is everything okay, Councillor Nelson? Yeah. So we'll move to the vote then. And that has been carried unanimously. Before we move on to the um, final item on the agenda, I'd like to go back to the monitoring officer. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, yeah, just a, a, a quick point, um, members. Um, the Chief Executive and I were having a, a, a brief discussion throughout that about motions moving forward. It may be beneficial when... Um, move in an amendment if uh, we actually do spell out in there what the changes are so what's been added what's been removed what's just for clarification so that we don't get into the you know is it is it actually what the amendment originally said and what's it actually changed so moving forward perhaps that's something members could be mindful of when they're putting together their amendments thank you the final item on the agenda is anything that I determine as being urgent and which requires a decision. You'll all be absolutely delighted to know that I have nothing. <laughs> so thank you all very much for your attendance this afternoon and I'll close the meeting. Safe journey home.